Hi, everyone. Well, again, I've mentioned on a couple of occasions that Chapter 7 is kind of a hodgepodge of topics, and I'm just picking out those that I've found to be most beneficial in my own uh, career arc as it pertains to probability. And I think, uh, I think that these are uh, interesting applications that happen to reside in Chapter 7, and they seem to be ones that come up a lot. The coupon collector problem is um, kind of a big deal. Uh, it's been generalized in a lot of different directions. So at least understanding the basic version of it, which we're doing here, is, is needful. Um, you want to go back and see a robust treatment of this, um, and you didn't happen to be with us in class on uh, Wednesday the 15th, um, Wednesday, uh, April 15th, you should go look up that class meeting on YouTube and, and check that out. Um, I went through this example in detail um, just to kind of uh, prime the pump a little bit. I will talk through this very, very briefly, not in, in, the, in the kind of length I did back there. And I wanted to justify, I promised that I would come back here in this lecture and justify uh, a last estimate that I did uh, at the very end. Okay, so again, the coupon collector problem is you have these indistinct prizes. Uh, each box uh, that you buy, okay, has a prize in it, like a Cracker Jack box or a cereal box. And each prize is equally likely to be present in a given box. And there's just one prize per box. And so the probability of any given prize, since there's capital in of them, is just one over n, okay? And the big question that you're trying to answer with the coupon collector problem is how many boxes do we expect to have to purchase before we have all the prizes? That's a legitimate question. You can see how this question would actually probably have applications outside of this you know, toy problem that we're messing with here. Um, you know, uh, you could imagine collecting samples of some kind and you want to see how long you're going to have to wait until you have one of every kind of uh, specimen or something, okay? Um, there was a bug problem that, that uh, is in the homework that Matthew and I had a discussion about. There's a couple of videos on that. Um, that's another type of coupon collector problem, and this thing has been generalized to the hilt, mainly because it, it has applications all over the place. Okay, so how many boxes do we expect to purchase before we have all the prizes under this paradigm? Okay, and what we did is we said, well, I'm going to let X be the number of boxes purchased until all prizes are obtained. And what we're really asking for is the expected value of X. Okay, and the next question we said is, is there a way to write X as a sum of simple random variables? Okay, because uh, in this chapter, we've been talking a lot about um, writing random variables as sums of indicators or things that are easy to deal with. Okay, and so the way that we did this was we said, well, I'm gonna let X1 be the number of boxes until I get the first prize. It's really boring because it's gonna be exactly one. Um, you're gonna buy a box and you're gonna get a prize that you did not have before. So um, the expected value of X1 is just one. X2 uh, is going to be the number of additional boxes purchased after the first prize is obtained, which is really after the first box was purchased, until a second new prize is obtained. That is a prize that's different from the one we got in the first box. Now, uh, in theory, I could just keep getting the same prize I got from the first box over and over and over again. So X2 just has to, it's gonna keep going until I just get something different from the first prize I got with the first box. And we thought about that and we said, well, the probability of that happening is basically one minus one over n. I just can't get the prize I already had, okay? And what I'm doing is I'm waiting for the first success, where success means to get a prize different from the first one. And so that's a geometric distribution. X2 has the geometric distribution with p equal to one minus one over n, um, which is uh, equal to n minus one over n. Okay, and then we started to see the pattern. So X3 is gonna be the number of additional boxes after prizes one and two are obtained until we get a uh, 
a third new prize. That's supposed to be a three right there, as garbled as it looks. Okay, third new prize. So uh, I'm done with our first two prizes, and then I start keeping track of the number of additional boxes I have to buy until I get a prize, a third prize, different from any of the previous prizes obtained. That again is going to be geometric, and I simply have to avoid those first two uh, prizes that I already have. Geometric with p equal to n minus two over n. And in general, xi is just gonna be the number of boxes after distinct prizes, uh, you know, uh, i minus one distinct prizes have already been chosen, obtained. Uh, the number of additional boxes we have to purchase until we get a new ith prize, different from the previous i minus one. And those are going to have distribution, the geometric with parameter p equal to n minus, basically parentheses, or a quantity i minus one, which is n minus i plus one all over n. And x is just going to be the sum, uh, right? X, remember x was the number of boxes we're going to purchase. X is simply going to be the sum of all those xi's from the very beginning. And one observation that we made was kind of a trivial one, was that really even x1 had the geometric distribution. It was just kind of a stupid geometric distribution. It was a geometric distribution with with p equal to n over n, which is just one, okay? So each of those xi's has the, each, even x1 has the geometric distribution with parameter n minus i plus one over n. And we said, okay, now I'm in business. I can actually compute the expected value of x, okay? Uh, by looking at the expected value of this simplified sum, thinking about each sum and individually because we can use linearity of expectation. And remember the expectation or the expected value of a geometric down there on the left hand side down here, right? The expected value of a geometric is just one over the proportion of success. So we just flip the proportion of success for each one of those geometrics and we get that sum and we factor out n and we end up getting n times the harmonic sum, the nth harmonic sum. These were my uh, me talking about my kids' special animals that they like to purchase. But uh, this guy right here, right, this guy right here is, call, is called the nth harmonic sum. Very, very important sum, a okay? very important sum indeed. And my claim was this, namely that this sum right here is well approximated, right? This sum right here is well approximated by the logarithm of the denominator of the last term, okay? And that might seem sort of mysterious, but then that gives us this ultimate approximation, which is actually very sharp. That is, it's really not <laughs> that much of an approximation at all. It's almost exact. Um, the expectation, Expected number of boxes is n times the logarithm of n, where n is the number of prizes one is trying to obtain. So the first thing I wanted to do was to go through this and actually try to justify why the nth harmonic sum is well approximated by that logarithm. So let's let's kind of spend some time on that. So so why okay why does this approximation actually work? Um, and that is a good question. I'm glad, glad you asked. Okay, so here's how this is going to go. Okay, so uh, everybody knows that the logarithm, uh, natural logarithm of x has derivative, derivative equal to um, 1 over x, yes? Another way to say that is the integral of one over x is equal to the logarithm of x, right? And, uh, and that's kind of the key to estimating uh, this, this sum. So watch this, okay? So here's, here's the graph of y equal, to, um, y equal to one over x, okay? And let's suppose for a minute, okay? So let's, let's suppose that this right here Okay, so this is one, one. Okay, so uh, here's two, 
Okay, and if that's two, then you know this this point on the curve is one half. Here's three. Okay, uh, so then there's going to be like one third. Let me make a little bit more room here. Okay, so this is one half, one third, etc. Okay, can go one more step here uh, to four right here. Okay, so watch this. Um, what if I went up to the curve here? Okay, here and here. Okay, well, what's the area? What's the area of each one of those? Well, it's one half, um, okay, one third, and one fourth, because I went up to the curve at the right hand endpoint each one of these times. Okay, so notice that one half, I mean, just look at the picture here. It's sort of obvious that one half, right? So I kind of go up here. One half uh, plus one third plus one fourth is going to be dominated by the area under that curve between one and four. Okay, so one half plus one third plus one fourth is is less than or equal to <laughs> the integral from one to four of logarithm of x, or, or sorry, not logarithm of x, I'm getting ahead of myself, of one over x dx, okay? Which, by the way, is equal to what? Well, that's logarithm of x, uh, uh, evaluated at four and one, and we take the difference. So this is equal to logarithm of four. Hmm. And by the same token, you could say things like one half plus one third. What, like, is there going to be anything different if I went out an extra term? One fourth plus dot, 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 plus uh, one over 50, for instance. If I went all the way out to 50, this is going to be smaller than or equal to the integral from one to 50. Okay, of one over x dx, which is just logarithm of 50. Okay, so that's interesting. And uh, so in general, what do, we, what do we know? We know that one half plus one third plus a fourth plus dot 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 plus a one over n, okay, no matter how far out I go, this is always going to be no more than the logarithm of n. Okay, so that's one thing to keep in mind here. Okay, that's one thing to keep in mind here. That is an important identity. Okay, that's the first, the first thing I want to say. But you might be saying to yourself, oh man, um, I see uh, something interest, something else that's interesting going uh, that's going on here. So for instance, like instead of like doing one half uh, and one third and one fourth, I could also have put the rectangles up at the left endpoint, okay? And if I do that, something, something interesting happens, okay? Um, so like, what is the area of that first rectangle? Well, that's gonna be, if I went up at the left endpoint, that area is gonna be one, okay? What about this area right here? Well, that area is the same as the rectangle with area one half, right? So this is one half, okay? And then, you know, I can do the same thing here. Okay, that area is one third. Obviously, it's just kind of, I've shifted over that rectangle of area one third. Okay, so that's one third. So uh, what, do you, what else do you see that we're gonna get here? Well, those rectangles actually dominate the integral from one to four. Okay, so the integral from one to four of one over x dx, okay, the integral from one to four of one over x dx is actually less than or equal to uh, what? One plus a half plus a third, okay? One plus a half plus a third. But what's the integral of from one to four of one over x dx, well, that's just logarithm of four, okay? And that's less than or equal to 
one plus a half plus a third. Okay. So, hmm, that's that's interesting, right? So I have logarithm of four. So, and, and by the way, um, that kind of gives us an idea of of a general uh, principle that's going on here. I mean, I, I didn't have to stop with just those those first three rectangles. I could have kept on going, right? So, um, what's what's a general principle that's at play here? Well, logarithm of n. Okay, logarithm of n. Here, I'll write it up here. Um, logarithm of n is less than or equal to one plus a half plus dot, 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 plus, okay, how far am I gonna go here? It'll be one over capital N minus one. Okay, so that's, that's interesting stuff. Okay, so let's go to the next page. And uh, this is a very important identity. Okay, so in other words, let me just, let me just kind of rewrite these down. Logarithm of N, is less than or equal to one plus a half plus a third plus dot 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 plus one over n minus one. And on the other hand, one half plus a third plus all the way up to one over n, this is less than or equal to logarithm of n, okay? So, um, wow, that's, that's interesting. So another way to say this is, I mean, I can kind of take this first guy right here, okay, and I could just add one to both sides, and I get that one plus a half plus a third plus dot, 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 all the way up to one over n is no more than one plus logarithm of n, okay? And on the other hand, I could take this second guy right here, and I could say, I could add one over n, which is a very small amount, okay? And I can actually say that one over n, add, add one over n to both sides, I could say that one over n plus uh, logarithm of n is no more than one plus a half plus a third, plus dot, 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 plus one over n, okay? So in other words, combining these two things, okay? Combining these two inequalities tells me that I have a nice bound for the nth harmonic sum, one plus a half plus a third plus dot 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 plus one over n is no more than one more than the logarithm of n. By the way, that one is gonna be peanuts compared to the value of logarithm of n once n gets big. Logarithm of n goes to infinity, yes? And if one is peanuts compared to that, then one over n is peanuts compared to logarithm of n. One over n is going to zero, okay? So this thing is greater than or equal to one over n plus logarithm of n. Okay, so this is like the ultimate, uh, the ultimate estimate right here. It's a very, very good estimate for the nth harmonic sum. Uh, basically what this says is that the nth harmonic sum behaves almost exactly like the logarithm function. In fact, if I divide through by logarithm of n, you see that the ratio of the nth harmonic sum and logarithm of n is gonna to tend to one as n goes to infinity. Okay, because dividing through by logarithm of n, the right-hand inequality would become one plus one over logarithm of n. That would go to one. And on the left-hand side, you're kind of, it's kind of like the squeeze theorem. The left-hand side, if I divide by logarithm of n, I'll get one plus one over n logarithm of n. In fact, let me just, let me just, uh, so let me just, kind of say, which implies dot, 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 right? So what we're gonna do is we'll divide everything by logarithm of n and just look at what happens. Okay, let's go to the next page. 
Uh, so I would get the nth harmonic sum divided by um, logarithm of n is less than or equal to uh, one plus one over logarithm of n and is greater than or equal to one plus one over n times logarithm of n, okay? And if you let n go to infinity, right, if I let capital N go to infinity, both of these things, both sides of this go to one, okay? So I'm applying the squeeze theorem here. That means that the ratio of the harmonic sum and logarithm of n as n goes to infinity, this thing is trapped between those two things which, is going, which are going to one. Therefore, by the squeeze theorem, the thing in between goes there too, okay? Uh, when this happens, uh, we write, we write things like this. Uh, we, we say that, that these two things are asymptotic. Okay, so we say that one plus a half plus uh, a third plus dot 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 plus one over n, that this thing is asymptotic to natural logarithm of n. It's unfortunate that that symbol is used for distributed as, <laughs> but this right here just means asymptotic. A, 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 or oops, asymptotic to, asymptotic to, okay? That just basically means their ratio tends to one as n goes to infinity, okay? So all that to say, I'm just gonna conclude this right here and we'll move on to something else. That means, you know, we, we had that the expected value of x is equal to is equal to n times the nth harmonic sum uh, plus one over n. Okay, and we just showed that that thing really is, uh, you know, uh, greater than or equal to, or, or I mean, this thing right here, I'll just say that this, this thing is asymptotic to n times logarithm of n. We could actually write down a rigorous inequality uh, that would trap the expectation between those two things. But the, the whole point is uh, the expected value of x is absolutely um, going to be asymptotic to n logarithm of n. For n large, it is indistinguishable from n logarithm of n. Okay? All right. So I'm going to leave it. I'm going to leave that one at that. We're going to move on to um, another topic. Understanding the a coupon collector problem is, is very, very interesting. And I also wanted to show you there's an identity that comes up fairly often and we'll develop it right now. And uh, I'm not going to tell you what it is. We're just going to straight up develop it from the ground floor here together. And it's the following. So here's another example. Um, and again, it's just going to be something that involves uh, at writing a random variable as a sum of other random variables and just following our nose. Okay, so let, let x be any uh, non-negative integer uh, random variable. Random variable. Oops, okay, how about this? I'll just write RV. Okay, um, uh, for all i greater than or equal to one, uh, define, define the following. Uh, you know, define a i, or, or, or just define the indicator of x greater than or equal to i, okay? Okay, which is just equal to, you guys know what this means. This is one if x is greater than or equal to i, okay? And it's zero otherwise, okay? All right, so that's, 
interesting. Okay. So why did I define these things? Oh, just watch what happens here. This is, this is kind, of, kind of interesting. So what happens, so just note the following. What would happen if I added all of these things together? Okay. If I take the sum i going from one to infinity of these indicators, okay, so these are the indicators of x being equal to or greater than i, okay? Well, obviously, okay, remember, so we had x, right? x was just any non-negative non integer random variable, okay? So this is equal to the sum uh, i going from one to x, which is sort of weird because x is random, um, but that's okay. You can, you can have that in one of the in, indices of summation. So this is gonna be the indicator of x greater than or equal to i, okay? Okay. And, and then this is going to be plus the sum i going from uh, x plus one, to infinity of the indicator of x greater than or equal to i, okay? Hmm. Well, let me rewrite this for a minute. Uh, and let's think about what the value of these indicators would be in these ranges of i, okay? So, so watch this. This is the same as writing, this is the sum uh, what's the deal with i going from 1 to x? Well, there i is less than or equal to x, okay? So this is 1 less than or equal to i, less than or equal to x, and this is going to be the indicator of x greater than or equal to i, plus the sum of i greater than x, the indicator of x being greater than or equal to i. Well, let me ask you a question. What's going on with these indicators? Uh, well, certainly, uh, if, if i is equal to or less than x, then x is equal to or greater than i. And therefore, what's the value of, of this thing? Well, it's one, okay? And if i is greater than x, then certainly x is not greater than or equal to i, okay? So what's the value of this indicator? Well, that's zero. So this whole sum right here becomes zero, okay? And this sum is just a sum of ones. So what do we end up getting here? Well, this thing is gonna be equal to, equal to what? Well, I'm gonna sum one together for i running from one to x, okay? Okay, so that's just x. Okay, so what, what have we done? We've noticed that x is equal to the sum of these indicators, okay? Overall, when, we, all, all, when all said and done here, we've shown that x is equal to the sum i going from one to infinity of these indicators. Okay, so that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of an interesting identity. It's gonna be pretty helpful to us here pretty soon. So we have this identity right here, okay? So let's see what that does, what that gives us in practice, okay? So I have x equaling the sum, i going from one to infinity, indicator x equal to or greater than i, and therefore, if I take expectations, I get that the expected value of x is going to be equal to the sum i going from 1 to infinity, the expected value of these indicators, okay? And what's that? Well, um, the expected value of an indicator is just the probability of the event in question. It's going to be sum i going from one to infinity of what? The probability that x is greater than or equal to i, okay? So you get for the expected value of x, okay? 
And that gives us a way of, uh, that gives us a way of computing the expected value in kind of an interesting way. Look at that. We have a, right, x was any, now remember, x is any non-negative integer random variable. Where did, we, where did we use the fact that it was a non-negative integer random variable? Okay. Um, well, uh, it was back here on the previous slide. Okay, the fact that we could actually write this thing. Okay, so right here. The fact that we could actually have that first sum be something that was non-trivial. Okay. Um, you know, uh, I guess... Um, I, I guess technically I probably could have started at zero. Um, but could it, would, would it have mattered if I would have started that thing at zero? X greater than or equal to zero, that for sure would it have been one. Okay. Um, hmm. Let me think about that for just a second. I'll be right back with you. Yeah, actually, that doesn't matter because um, I started with just looking at this sum right here. Okay, I started with just looking at this sum right here. If x, so watch this. Let me let me just kind of remark over here. Um, hmm. So what if what if x was equal to zero? Well, if x was equal to zero, capital X is equal to zero, this first sum would just, it would be empty. And I would just have a silly, uh, all I would be doing is I wouldn't be rewriting anything over here, okay? The second sum right here would just be um, the sum from one to infinity again, okay? And similarly, this first sum right here would be zero, okay? And so on the event x equal to zero, nothing really, uh, nothing really contributes anything, okay? And all I was doing was, was just looking at this sum right here from one to infinity. And in the end, I ended up discovering that that was equal to x itself, okay? So that's, that's helpful. And I'm gonna, I wanna show you an example of, of an application of this. Right, I just, thought of, I just thought of a clearer way to say what I was saying before. So for instance, I mean, just look at this identity again, okay? So that identity right there, what if x was zero? Well, if x is zero, clearly the right-hand side is zero. Well, but what about the left-hand side? What would all those indicators be? If x is zero, could x be bigger than or equal to any integer greater than zero? No, all of those indicators would be zero. So that sum would be zero on the left. So if x is zero, that sum is zero, okay? So the only other case we have to consider is what if x is bigger than or equal to one, and then this argument we just gave goes through completely. So this identity holds, uh, this identity holds no matter what the value of x is, but it does, it does require that x be a non-negative integer random variable so that doing the sum makes sense. I can't have x being equal to pi or something and have that sum from one to x make any sense, okay? So let's go back over here. This was the ultimate formula we got. X is any non-negative integer random variable, and I got that identity right there. Okay, so let's, let's actually apply this in a specific case that we've seen before. Okay, so, oops, what's going on here? Okay, plus, there we go. All right, so what if I have X being a geometric with proportion of success, P, okay? Um, we've done this sort of thing before, but I'm gonna do it again, now remember, um, you know, P of X is equal to, so first of all, this thing belongs to one, two, three, et cetera, right? So those are the possible outcomes for the geometric with proportion of success P. 
what's p of x? Well, that's equal to, uh, that means that I got my first success on the x trial, okay? So that means I had x minus one failures followed by a success, one success. So that means I get q to the x minus one times p. Remember, we've done this before, so that's x equal to or greater than one and an integer, okay? So what is the probability that capital X is greater than or equal to I, all right? What is the probability that capital X is equal to or greater than I? Well, it's going to be Q to the I minus one, right? Because that's, that's when it's equal to I, plus Q to the I, that's when X is equal to I plus one times P, plus Q to the I plus one times P plus et cetera. Okay, so what's that gonna be equal to? Well, I can factor out Q to the I minus one times P, and what's left behind is one plus Q plus Q squared plus et cetera. We've done this before. Okay, and this is gonna be Q to the I minus one times P over one minus Q. This is P, these cancel, and you're left with Q to the I minus one. We have done that before, okay? And by the way, uh, so if this, this is just for any i greater than or equal to one. Probability x is greater than or equal to i is just q to the i minus one. And we've kind of, we've reasoned this out before. Basically, what, if, if x, the number of successes, is at least i, that means I, had, uh, that means I had i minus one failures for sure. And then whatever happened after that um, is uh, immaterial to us. So it makes sense that it would just be Q to the I minus one. Okay, so what would be the expected value of X? Well, we just found that formula. It says it's gonna be the sum I going from one to infinity, the probability that X is equal to or greater than I, which is gonna be the sum I going from one to infinity, Q to the I minus one, which is one plus Q plus Q squared, plus et cetera, which is one over one minus Q, which is, P, which is one over P. Which is one over P. Okay, so this is a very, very helpful formula for the expectation that we haven't seen before. Usually we have, you know, expectation of X is equal to X times P of X, and we have to go through that. Um, we have not seen this particular identity before. And it turns out there's a similar one in the case of continuous random variables. It's a pretty helpful thing to have in your back pocket. Sometimes this, this uh, version of the formula um, uh, is, is more helpful when you have a really complicated uh, random variable where multiplying x by the probability is gonna just make it even more complicated. So sometimes it's easier to think about, well, what's the probability it's at least something? And that's easier to deal with. You can sum those together and it turns out some nice things can happen, okay? Whereas, uh, look, look at this, look how easy it was to compute this expectation. I'm, I'm telling you, if you go back to how we did this before, it was sort of complicated. We had to multiply x times q to the x minus one times p. We had to think about it and say, oh, it looks like I took some kind of derivative. Remember that? And we had to do a lot of, kind of series manipulation, thinking along those lines. That was totally unnecessary here. Uh, this thing just yielded immediately. Okay. One more thing, and, and we'll kind of call it a day. We looked at this briefly um, last time uh, in dealing with the hypergeometric distribution, but I just wanted, you to, wanted to show you that this is actually very general. So let's talk about the moments of the number of events that occur. So the setup here is A1 through AN are any events at all. I don't care what they are. They could be highly dependent, they could be independent, whatever, doesn't matter. And I'm gonna define X to just simply be the number of these events that occur, okay? So uh, the number of the events that occur, that's, okay, so like what's the expected value of this, okay? Well, first of all, actually, before I do that, uh, first, let, let's just note the following. Uh, is it clear to you that X is going to be the sum I going from one to N 
uh, of the indicator of AI, okay? Because that's simply going to say, did A1 occur? Uh, yep. Well, that counts as one toward X. If not, it counts as zero toward X. This is exactly uh, what X is equal to in, in terms of the sums of indicators of these events. Okay, so what is the expected value of X? Well, it's gonna be the sum, because I can just use linearity of expectation. It's gonna be the expected value of these indicators. And we're going to get the sum, I going from one to N, the probability of AI, okay? Question. What if we want pairs of events instead, okay, i.e. we want to know uh, the expected number of pairs of events that happen. Okay, so uh, what do we do about that? Well, we kind of encountered this last time with the hypergeometric. One thing we notice is that the is the following: that uh, you know, suppose that one is less than or equal to i is less than j is equal to or less than n. Okay. So if that's true, then AI and AJ happen if and only if, uh, if and only if a one AI times one AJ is equal to one, okay? So in other words, um, AI, right? So this, that's if and only if, the indicator of AI intersected with AJ is equal to one, right? So the indicator tells us when AI and AJ happen, okay? So also notice that X choose two is equal to, remember X, X was the number of events that happen. Okay, so X choose two is the number of pairs of events, but that has to also be equal to, right? These indicators also count one or zero for each pair of, event, of events. So this is like one equal to or less than I, less than J equal to or less than N, the indicator of AI intersected with AJ, okay? So the expectation of X choose two is equal to a sum one less than or equal to I less than J less than or equal to N, the probability of AI and AJ, because I would, the probability of an indicator is just, uh, is just the probability of the event in question, okay? So in other words, look at this, I mean, this left-hand side though, that's just the expected value of X times X minus one over two, right? So that means that the expected value, right? If I multiply through by two, the expected value of um, X times X minus one is equal to two times this sum sum i less j, probability of ai and aj, okay? And I've already talked to you before, the book doesn't really ever do this, but I, I sometimes like to write this as the expected value of x falling to, okay? And Pockhammer symbol, um, it's a falling factorial, okay? It's also x put to, if you will, okay? But Sometimes X itself won't be an integer or random variable. So sometimes it's not entirely correct to talk about put um, falling factorial is always defined though, even if X is a non-integer, okay? So what about higher things? 
Okay. What about, uh, so what about three sets of events? Okay. Well, again, uh, you could do X choose three. This is going to be equal to what? Sum I less J less K, the probability of AI, or sorry, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Not the probability yet, just going to be the indicator of AI and AJ and AK. Okay, that thing is one uh, if and only if those three events happen. Okay. So that means the expected value of x choose three is gonna be equal to the sum of i less j less k, the probability of the product of these three events. Okay, and last time we were actually computing some of these uh, in the context of the hypergeometric, but we don't know anything about these events right now. It just has, it depends on the context in which we find ourselves. But the whole point here is like, Look at this, Th that, this is the same thing as saying the expected value of what? I can kind of cancel stuff. X choose three would be uh, X times X minus one times X minus two over three factorial. Okay, so which is the same thing as the expected value of, you know, X falling three, which is the expected value of X times X minus one times X minus two. Uh, is equal to, I'd have to multiply three by three factorial. So this would be three factorial times the sum, I less J less K, the probability of AI intersected with AJ intersected with AK. Okay. And in general, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, and by the way, we've talked about this before, but I can get, the, I can get all the moments that is expected value of x to the three, for instance, I can get that from using the previous ones. Like, you know, the expected value of x falling two is x, is that that's the expected value of x squared minus the expected value of x, okay? And so I could get my hands on the expected value of x squared if I know the expected value of x, which I do, right? I mean, because, you know, look back here at the, oops, let's see, let's look back here at the beginning. Expected value of x is this sum, so in theory I would be able to compute that. This guy right here, uh, right, so this, let me just kind of remark, this guy right here, that is just the expected value of x squared minus the expected value of x. So I could get my hands on uh, the expected value of x squared by simply adding the expected value of x to both sides. Okay, so that's, that's a nice thing to have in hand. And then once I have the expected value of X and the expected value of X squared, I could use the X falling three expectation uh, and then get my hands on expected value of X cubed from that. But back over here, uh, what is the expected value? Let's just kind of write down a final equation here. What's the expected value of X falling K going to be? Um, well, uh, so yeah, it's going to be k factorial. Oops, sorry. Uh, give me a second here. All right, sorry about that. So the expected value of x falling k is equal to k factorial times the sum, okay? So here, what am I talking about? I'm talking about, you know, K sets of events, okay? So it's gonna be I1 less I2 less dot, 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 less IK of what? Of the probability that A I1 intersected with, or that A I1 happens and every one of these has to happen. Okay. And that's a nice formula to have in our back pockets. Okay. Uh, sometimes computing uh, these falling factorial moments is, uh, 
is a lot easier to do. We saw that that, that was indeed the case for the hypergeometric last time. So this is just a nice formula to have in our back pockets. And in fact, next time what I'll do is I'll take this formula and we'll look again with fresh eyes at the binomial uh, distribution. And we'll look at higher moments of that in the light of this nice little formula right here, okay? Hope you have a good weekend. Hope things are going well with the project. Be sure to ask questions uh, if they should arise. And, uh, and I, I have been praying for you all. I hope things are going well. See you soon.